All right, so we are starting to talk about simulated annealing as one application of deterministic travel times. Remember, deterministic travel times allow us to forward calculate travel times from the entire velocity field, not just the slowness perturbation field. So we don't have to have a linearized velocity or slowness field. They give us those uh, travel times from any source to anywhere else in the model uh, in the section in the 3D volume at um, uh, very fast. So um, you know we can, we can imagine taking a seismic survey that has hundreds of sources and hundreds of receivers. So you know tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand uh, different uh, traces with a, um, um, with a first arrival time uh, or a reflection time picked on every one of those traces. Uh, so a data set uh, you know, that has a uh, hundred thousand um, um, uh, dimensions, a uh, hundred thousand values, and uh, and very quickly now calculating the um, calculating the uh, uh, the travel time um, uh, uh, each one of those travel times as a uh, as a synthetic from a from a model. And simulated annealing tests in sequence uh, trial models, and um, so the uh, the key here is uh, are really two. What uh, distinguishes simulated annealing from the genetic algorithm is mainly that the while the genetic algorithm has to have a population of of different models that you interbreed to produce a a new generation of of models. Simulated annealing has just uh, one model at a time, uh, and you uh, once you've figured out how to perturb it randomly, um, then you can uh, uh, you can test those models in in sequence, and hopefully arrive at the uh, the global um, uh, the global minimum error uh, in um, in a uh, a minimum amount of time. Now, uh, uh, another thing that distinguishes simulated annealing is uh, how these, this new model is accepted or rejected. So we're constantly, um, you know, modifying. Uh, we're adding. Uh, what Satish does is he adds a randomly sized, randomly located box of random velocity to a. Um, uh, to a previous model, and then uh, uh, you project all your travel times uh, for to match all your your whole data set through that, and then you calculate the error rel of the uh, travel time data set relative to the uh, original travel times. Okay, and uh, so the error of the previous model, call that e zero, and uh, uh, the error of the new model, call that e one. And so, under simulated annealing, if uh, if e one is uh, less than e zero, and in the simulated annealing concept of crystallizing from a melt, uh, if the energy state of the additions to the crystal are uh, are less, in other words, we are adding to existing crystal structures as we cool, then we accept that new model. We accept that new state. Okay. Uh, now, of course, this is what you would do uh, in a, um, you know, even in a, a, um, a Monte Car a very simple Monte Carlo scheme where you were, you know, testing your model space on a grid. Um, you know, usually it's uh, like a twenty-six dimensional grid or something. And here we have a, uh, you know, ten thousand or or million dimensional grid um, that we would have to set up. Uh, but the principle is the same. If uh, if the new model has less error, then you take it. Um, uh, what's special about simulated annealing is that it it, uh, it says even if the new error is greater, we might still accept it. And this is what allows simulated annealing to climb out of local minima in the error. So uh, the uh, probability of acceptance is going to be the simulated annealing conditional probability p sub c. And p sub c is equal to e to the power of this this term here, okay? 
And uh, what is this? What is this term? It's uh, the uh, our concept of the minimum error, uh, which would be the, uh, the the for instance the data error, or maybe maybe we're going to try for zero, and uh, we uh, we take that uh, that difference in the error. So that's our you know that's how much our error is still out of whack, how much our energy is still above the uh, the minimum, and uh, we operate on it with a uh, with a power q. Um, and uh, then we have the uh, 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 we multiply that by the change in error. In other words, the uh, uh, you know how much have we have we increased the error over the previous model? Delta e is uh, is uh, e one minus e zero. Okay, and then um, uh, we divide by this quantity t. And the the idea uh, the reason it's called t is the that that's a temperature. Okay. So um, if um, uh, thinking about a crystal crystallizing melt again, at high temperature, all right, you want the uh, um, you want the melt you know very active and the and the atoms in the in the melt vibrating a lot and really able to join any one of the structures of small crystals that are that might be nearby, okay. And so, as as t gets larger, of course, the uh, the exponential is um, is uh, um, uh, is is smaller, and the conditional probability gets larger. Okay, um, and it, as uh, you know, as the melt cools, then you want t to get uh, smaller, right? T is going to become less as the melt cools, and then the conditional probability Will get smaller. Okay, now uh, all right. So depending on the amount of error that we have in the new model, and and how far we are above the uh, uh, the error we would like to end up with, um, which might be very close to zero. Okay, we calculate this conditional probability. All right, and so then we basically roll a die and uh, and say, all right, we generate a random number. And if the uh, if the random number is less than the conditional probability, then uh, um, then we don't accept that model. And if the random number is greater than the conditional probability, then we do accept the model. So, in summary, if the new model has uh, has uh, less error than the old model, then we always accept it. If uh, uh, if the new model has greater error than the old model. Then we might accept it depending on this conditional probability. All right, so you can see what happens here. This is a um, uh, a plot of error versus iteration number, and so um, the uh, the temperature starts very high, and then um, and as you can see, the 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 errors of the of the models are all over the place. You know, some of them are very low. Uh, some of them are are very high. You can have a very uh, at a high temperature. You can have a a very uh, low um, uh, error followed by a very high one. But you you know this is only the uh, errors of the accepted models, okay? And uh, and you keep cooling until you reach a critical temperature. And at that point, you can see that that really no um, no further uh, uh, models are accepted. So here's uh, the curve from uh, Satish's thesis about uh, uh, how you how you cool. All right. So um, uh, and the temperature you can see is a, is a basically uh, this is plotting the temperature on a log scale, right? Log of temperature. So you start with a very high temperature, you know, like uh, uh, ten, and then uh, you know rapidly it cools to one. And then to um, the critical temperature, which for this particular case is uh, 0.1, and then um, uh, uh, and the critical. I guess the uh, if this is the same, let's see. The critical temperature looks like it's reached at uh, 5,000 iterations, maybe 3,000. Um, so I'm not sure this is the same run. Okay, it's probably not the same run. Um, so I would guess that here, uh, you know, it's at iteration twenty-five thousand or so that the uh, no two hundred uh, twenty-five hundred that the critical temperature gets reached, 
And then uh, after a while, the critical temperature, you cool it further to uh, slowly anneal it. And what usually happens is that you know out here, uh, when we're below the at a temperature at the critical temperature below, very very few models get accepted. Really, what we're looking at here is you know a model accepted here, and then there's a straight line to the next model which is accepted, which is probably here, and then another model gets accepted out here, and maybe there's a model accepted way out here at uh, at uh, iteration thirty three thousand or thirty three thousand, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, that's the uh, that's a cooling scheme for a uh, that's this uh, this scheme here, okay? That's a cooling scheme for a simulated annealing, um, and uh, uh, but that's not everything you need, right? So you uh, uh, to get the the cooling scheme, you need to know what the critical temperature is. To get the you also need this Q. You know what the heck is Q? Well, that's very problem dependent. Depends a lot on on how you um, how you determine the uh, uh, the you know the model space size the uh, dimensionality of the model space depends on on um, uh, uh, you know how many degrees of freedom there really are uh, depends on the noise and the data uh, it, it's problem dependent so what Satish uh, decided to do is he took the suggestion uh, which I forget where he got. Uh, got that from now, is uh, he would evaluate the error after a short run, okay? Uh, with a number, and a, by, by short run, he means having a number of iterations less than the square root of the model space dimension, okay? So, uh, you know, for a million, um, that's uh, like a thousand, uh, thousand iteration, a million, you know, a million uh, dimensional model space. Which a lot of these travel time tomography problems have, you know, that's a um, uh, that's a thousand uh, uh, iterations. So um, uh, he uh, uh, and and he makes these runs using some value of Q, okay, that stays constant, and a constant each run um, is made with a constant value of T, and so those thousand iterations are done with a T of minus six. You know, with a t of of, uh, of ten to the minus five, right? This is the log of t, uh, t of ten to the minus uh, four, um, and then uh, he it turns out uh, the ten thousand, uh, the thousand iterations with a with a t of uh, of uh, ten to the minus one, uh, that uh, point one, that ended up uh, giving the uh, smallest error after. Uh, um, after uh, uh, the, the 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 thousand runs, and then as temperature, you know, the the, the thousand run um, trials at higher uh, uh, critical temperatures uh, didn't result in anything, uh, um, or at higher temperatures didn't result in any uh, anything uh, less. So uh, uh, that's uh, how Satish decided to choose the critical temperature, and that's why you see that uh, being done here. And he chooses Q in a very similar way. Um, again, short runs, uh, you know, uh, for a million dimensional model space, uh, just just um, uh, ten thousand, uh, uh, just a thousand uh, uh, um, iterations. And what's the uh, what's the uh, using a constant Q now? And and he he does use the. Uh, uh, the critical temperature that gave the low uh, the low error, um, you know, which what value of Q and and this is again, uh, uh, you know, Q is is an exponent, so uh, you know here he tried minus four uh, all the way up to uh, uh, to plus um, uh, to plus four, okay, and the, it was uh, plus two. That gave the uh, the lowest error um, of uh, all those in the in these uh, trial uh, short runs. So here's a, a little slide uh, uh, that's kind of the takeaway um, 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 simulated annealing uh, method. So you have uh, first arrivals, you have calculated times, you have an objective function that evaluates your error at any for any given uh, uh, um, um, 
combination of uh, of uh, data and uh, and model uh, with the calculated times, which we get using deterministic travel time uh, methods. The Dolly's method, in particular, is what we started with. And then, uh, if the uh, if the error is uh, is less, then uh, we accept the new model, and we continue iterating until we get. Uh, uh, to the minimum error that we that we want, um, and we probably end up with a suite of uh, of um, of uh, uh, models that all have uh, about the same uh, minimum error. Um, we uh, uh, but uh, even if the error is larger, we might still accept the model based on a dice roll uh, to see if we're above this conditional probability and. Um, yeah, there's uh, the definition of delta e, and um, and the conditional probability depends on uh, on uh, delta e. It depends on on this uh, exponent q. It depends on the the difference between the error that we have and the uh, the error at uh, that that we want at at the minimum, and then it also depends on this temperature, and we need to uh, uh, cool and reduce the temperature gradually. Really quick. Yeah. How do you know what the, the true global minimum is? You know that that I would take to be the uh, uh, this is like uh, uh, Kyle's uh, problem of calculating the uh, the was it the chi squared test. Yeah. You know, if your if your data have an error that uh, you know natively that is a certain number of uh, certain RMS you know of time, then. Uh, why should you know if you if you reduced your error to less than that, you would kind of be overfitting your data. So um, uh, it's it's got that reason as well. You, you don't want to set the minimum error to to zero because then you're you're going to be iterating forever. Mm. Okay, you got to got to have some way of stopping the iteration, and so you know that's our our heuristic uh, decision is to stop the iteration when. We think we have uh, have reached the the error in the data. So how do you do that? Do you, do you look at the what do you think the resolution can be of the, the maximum? Yeah, you know how accurately can you pick travel times? Uh, uh, you know maybe you've got more error picking them at far offsets than near offsets, um, and so you just add all that up into an RMS error, just like you know, just like calculating the uh, is that a the error here? Error that you have to give the, the program beforehand. Yeah, yeah, okay. the the minimum error. You, but it doesn't calculate that from the data. That's, uh, um, you know, how size opt at two D as used by engineers sets e min. You know, that's probably a trade secret. Okay. Okay. So uh, I I I I don't know um, actually whether. Uh, yeah, that's probably true. That's probably true. So it'll just it'll find the very best one. Like you, like in my codes, I set min zero. You do that if you want to. Right, right. And you just run it for like I run it for some maximum number of iterations. Six hundred thousand iterations, and then it just will give you the best answer. You can do it that way, or you can say, okay, if it gets to ten milliseconds, that's the error in my measurements. So we should stop there. Keep our chi squared. So, so would you run into that problem of uh, with giving the data to use e min equals zero? Yeah. Well, you could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of you you've got e min in mind when you decide how how many um, uh, uh, how many iterations to do, right? Where to stop your your iteration? That's that's you know for your particular problem, you can dis you can observe that. Um, and uh, that also uh, and so that's that's probably also what Satish did in, in creating uh, size opt at two D. You know, all of the surveys are pretty standard. They're picked in a standard way. They're they're done in in you know the same kind of environment. You know, they they all have about the same uh, data error. So. That e min though that determines whether or not you're going to accept the worst model, right? So yeah, yeah, it has an effect on the iteration. That's so right. Which will 
you know, effectively possibly take you out of the local minimum and move you towards the global minimum or not. So that it seems like an important parameter. Yeah, for for this, um, um, you know, for the the seismic travel time um, optimization problem, uh, there's a lot of latitude. You know, you can see uh, that uh, there are different values of the critical temperature which all would work about the same. There are different values of Q which all work about the same. You could explore, you know, and I don't think Satish did this, but uh, uh, he's probably done it since, but uh, you, could, you could do the similar kind of exploration of what effect uh, different values of E min have. And, you know, you probably will discover that as long as you're within a factor of 10, um, you're of, of, of some ideal value, whatever that is, that you're probably okay. What I found is with E min, it'll, those curves, if you go up some to like the next figures, it'll basically just shift those. That's basically how it looks. But uh, you can shift like the, the minimum. Like if you set the E min really high, it'll generally accept more models. You mean the short run, the short run curve? Yeah. So you would just. Oh, oh, you mean the iteration curve? No, the, I'm talking about the critical temperature exploration. Oh, okay, okay. So it'll shift that around. Okay, uh, so okay. Emin, right, Emin plays off against uh, uh, against the cooling schedule and Q. Okay, and like maybe, as it should. If it accepts more models that have a higher error, then it has to do more runs to make sure that that you're you're compensating for that. Yeah. I you have to do the peaks, the critical temperature analysis every time you set up a new model. Right. Yeah, every time you change E min, if I want to change Q, I have to do it again. But it's always about the same. It just moves, just shifts it. So maybe a fact, I mean, Q would change by one, you know, and, and the critical temperature might change by a factor of 10. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so. Uh, you know, these are all things that are explored in Satish's thesis and his papers. Um, and uh, uh, there's um, uh, some of the early uh, uh, results and observations I'd like to uh, relate to you guys here. Um, so so uh, the first thing that we had to pay attention to is, is the fact that uh, seismic rays never sample all, all of our models. And um, you know the uh, the uh, uh, so that means in a linearized inversion, uh, you get singularities and you get uh, you know poorly constrained uh, parts of the model uh, that that can blow up. You know they can produce uh, uh, because you could put anything in there, uh, they blow up. Now uh, uh, what um, what we get in in a simulated annealing result is indeterminates among this collection. Of low error models, we might, you know, even after we've done all the work and we've determined, you know, uh, what our what our minimum error is, and set it to some ideal uh, amount, then um, we might still have a um, um, hundred models, all of which are real close to the minimum error. Okay, and so uh, uh, what Satish shows in his thesis and paper. Which uh, is not in the uh, it's not in the um, um, in size opta two D because engineers the, the engineering customers just hate uh, error bars and indeterminates, okay. But it's all you know it's all all was done is that uh, you can take those hundred models that all had the same error and at every uh, every part of the model you um, you compute the um, the uh, the average at every pixel in the model. And then when you compute the average, you can also compute the standard deviation. Okay, and these are this is the normalized uh, version of the standard deviation. It's normalized by the average uh, velocity. Okay, and you can see that that there's a lot of indeterminates, say down in this lower right corner. And uh, where did that come from? Well, the other thing you can do with the uh, the average model or or any of the final models is you can Trace the rays through it, and and uh, you know using the exactly the the methods that I showed you above, you know those ray tubes determined from 
adding uh, the uh, the various travel time uh, sections, and you and then you can get the hit count of how many rays are in what part of the model. And of course, that lower you know for a refraction survey that's uh, got sources along a line, but not uh, not off the ends of the line, or not far off the ends of the line. Of course, there are certain depths you're not going to reach. There are certain places that, uh, like these lower corners, that are not reached, and that's where that indeterminance comes from. Okay, so uh, uh, you know that's a way of looking at the uh, um, the indeterminance that comes out of the uh, these uh, simulated annealing optimizations. And Satish also set up a linearized system um, and compared. Uh, the uh, 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 the act, act the uh, act the uh, uh, action of a um, a linearized inversion against a um, uh, against a simulated annealing. So uh, here's the setup of the problem. Um, he's got uh, uh, the uh, uh, the model, the data, and um, uh, the data residual, uh, of course, linearized is on the uh, is on the left, and um, uh, you know GM is the uh, um, the, uh, the the partials, and then uh, here's the uh, uh, let's see there M is the model, okay, um, and uh, you know here's a, uh, a smoothing constraint and a and a um, a, um, uh, a a constraint to uh, this lambda uh, delta is a uh, it's is a constraint to to avoid um, uh, singular values. Okay, he did a singular value decomposition on this, uh, and uh, so um, here's an example with a uh, a synthetic uh, uh, you know call it true model. And you can see it's a basin, okay. And then uh, here's the annealing result, uh, starting with a uh, a starting model that is uh, constant three kilometers per second. Here's the annealing result, uh, resulting uh, from a starting model uh, that is a constant eight kilometers per second. Uh, there really aren't any differences uh, between this. Um, you know, you, you change the random numbers, uh, but you follow the same uh, cooling schedule, and uh, you have all those uh, thousands and thousands of iterations. You get the same result. The SVD, uh, on the other hand, uh, when you start with a fast uh, uh, initial model, constant again, at 8 kilom kilometers per second, um, you... Um, uh, you end up with a sort of reasonable model. You start at three kilometers per second, and it falls into a local minimum. You get a different model. Okay, uh, so it's very sensitive to that uh, um, to that initial model. This is just a different plot of the SVD showing how, in this lower corner, as we saw, uh, that uh, it's blowing up. You know, even though the singular the, the, there aren't any singular values, right? It's still, um, uh, you know, down here it's unconstrained, and it's still divided by, uh, you know, no rays, and uh, but the SVD has to put something there, and so it puts something there, velocities there that are above uh, ten kilometers per second, which is obviously ridiculous. Um, let's see, uh, you can look at uh, uh, different. Um, uh, Different ways of uh, of examining, you know, we we're just looking at these models uh, 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 visually. You know, what about uh, uh, what about uh, taking some simple uh, measure like a uh, uh, one way travel time vertically through each model? You know, what does that uh, what does that do? The true model has this uh, this black line here. Okay, that's the black mo line for the true model. You can see it's uh, uh, it's all the same at the uh, at the edges, and then where you have the basin, of course, there's a delay. Uh, the travel times, the vertical travel times, are larger. Okay, 
the simulated annealing, um, whether, uh, uh, and there's actually two curves there. I think there's a, a dark green, a dark curve and a dark red curve and a light red curve, light red curves on the top. Uh, and it's off uh, uh, on the right side because, of course, of that unconstrained uh, lower right corner. Uh, but you get onto the constrained part, and it has matched the basin vertical travel times very well. And then you get towards the edge again, and its, uh, it's ac accuracy falls off. Um, but uh, uh, look at what happens with the SVD. You start with the SVD at 8 kilometers per second initial model. And uh, it can sort of match it in some areas, but it's just wildly off. And if it was wildly off uh, the same way, you know, no matter how you started it, uh, that might be OK, but it's not. Uh, the, the blue curve then is the SVD at uh, 3 kilometers per second. And that is um, uh, uh, crazily off in a different way, although maybe it matches the, uh, the basin delays better vertically. Uh, you can have uh, uh, highly nonlinear situations like uh, this. Uh, this is a, uh, a reflection travel time inversion, where we're uh, inverting for the uh, <coughs> we're, we're inverting at the same time for uh, reflector depth and the velocity above the reflector. Okay, and um, so uh, uh, our model space has even grown uh, larger now because we're including the reflector geometry, and not by much. The reflector geometry doesn't add that much. So uh, looking at this uh, at this comparison here, we have uh, a uh, um, a uh, true model which has a, a sharp step in uh, in the uh, depth, and then uh, the annealing. Uh, is uh, this curve here, and it's able to see it. It's 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 not uh, able to represent the entire, you know, the entirely sharp uh, part of it, um, and uh, and then uh, you know we give it a, a, a flat uh, depth in uh, a flat dip in the initial um, uh, model, and for the annealing that doesn't make any difference. The SVD is this one. It's a very smooth. Representation of that of that model, okay, and uh, we've got these velocity uh, uh, high and low velocity uh, perturbations that are that are above the the reflector, and um, let's see, uh, I think uh, I can't remember actually. Sorry, which one is SVD and which one is uh, probably the smoother one is the SVD solution for the velocity. And this is the solution for the uh, up here in the middle. That's the solution for from uh, simulated annealing. Now you would think, you know, the SVD you only need uh, uh, dozens of iterations um, to converge that, but um, the um, uh, so, so whereas you need you know hundreds of thousands of iterations for the uh, the simulated annealing, but um, because of the time required to compute the partial derivatives of uh, of g up in here, um, you know, just to set up the problem, uh, the uh, the linearized method is not any faster than simulated annealing. So simulated annealing in this case, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Satish's papers and thesis, is uh, faster and more accurate and more stable. Another thing that uh, is interesting that, that Satish brought out uh, was this uh, idea, you know, I mean, why is simulated annealing working well for the travel time problem? Okay, and, and it really has, has to do with uh, uh, some theoretical work that Albert Tarantola did uh, uh, several years back, uh, which uh, uh, showed that the data, uh, travel time data in seismic reflection in particular and seismic refraction has a uh, uh, it has a, an error uh, that um, you know an uncertainty a distribution of uh, of um, of values that has a certain uh, exponential form you know it's got a bell curve form as you would expect out of almost any natural phenomenon and uh, that uh, that form you can see uh, uh, 
is is represented in, in the in the uh, it, it's very similar to what's uh, what's shown in the uh, uh, and this is that that form here this uh, sigma calculation and and basically what you see is uh, for for simulated annealing you know the conditional probability is controlled by an exponential that's essentially the same form it's got the error uh, on top and it's divided by uh, by some number okay so um, it's the same negative exponential, and um, so uh, what this is saying is that uh, uh, we are uh, with simulated annealing, we are following the error distribution, the uncertainty distribution in the data. Okay, the data distribution, um, uh, the, which is a a, a a priori probability density. Is matched by the output of our of our model, okay, and the way that we are we are determining our our uh, um, our, our probability of accepting new models with it matches the posteriori probability density function, okay. So um, uh, you know the probability of a model having a large data error is is low. And um, you know the uh, uh, the the probability uh, increases as we as we get closer to the uh, to the truth. Okay. So um, uh, what what this means is that we're preferentially sampling in simulated annealing the model space near the error minimum. Okay. So let's see if. Uh, uh, We've got a little uh, a little time for uh, uh, for some uh, more um, case history examples. Um, we started using uh, um, Satish's uh, simulated annealing near faults right away, and uh, I've shown you in the before in this class uh, this case uh, of the uh, of the Garlock fault, where uh, we have a seismic line that crosses uh, uh, a uh, uh, a pull apart basin in the in the left lateral Garlock fault, um, and uh, Satish's uh, um, you know here's a here's a real not a synthetic but a a, a real uh, uh, um, uh, case. Uh, here's the uh, uh, you know picking uh, after picking the reflections, okay. Um, Here's uh, where the uh, reflection depths come out. Okay, so they're a uh, south dipping, uh, um, you know, s showing that south south dipping Listrick fault plane that comes to the surface uh, just off the survey here. And um, uh, here's the error for all the iterations. You can see the temperature is being reduced, um, and uh, but there are lots of points, you know, especially as the temperature gets reduced, there are no accepted models. Yes, yes, but you could see there was great value in continuing, okay? Um, you know, because the error, the, the temperature is just dropping very low. But then he's, you know, he's found his way into that, uh, you know, low error posteriori uh, probability density. And, uh, and these last models here, there's a, there's a few accepted models. And, and so they're, uh, even at the lowest temperature, he's there. And and he can reduce the error a little bit more. Um, and you can see it makes very little difference to the you know even though there's there's not that much data, um, you know it makes very little difference to the model what the starting model is. You know it's really just uh, uh, you know random uh, random variation. Okay, initial model of two point five kilometers per second or four or eight. A 0.3 kilometers per second, which is kind of the whole range of velocities possible in that area. So uh, you know we get a pretty stable uh, result for the uh, velocity distribution in the uh, um, in the uh, uh, in the basin. All right. So there are some more examples you can look at here. I don't have time to go through. I've talked a little bit about the Hosgree. Um, uh, I would. Uh, Put your attention to this coherency imaging paper where 
we, uh, we modified our, um, our uh, error to uh, look at the coherency uh, and, and use that as kind of our energy. So we didn't have to pick uh, uh, travel times from reflections. And that was able to uh, reduce the, uh, uh, you know, going from uh, simple uh, first arrivals to uh, incorporating coherency. Uh, you know, this is uh, in the middle with reflected uh, ray times. And then with the full coherency, we get uh, the best model coverage. And then there's some details on the coherency optimization there. And then the effects of the coherency optimization on the, uh, uh, on the images we get. Uh, take a look at that in your abundant free time. And uh, we're going to go on to uh, talking more about uh, how to iterate linearized models. And I think the advantages of simulated annealing will become even clearer as we work our way through that. OK. Got to stop.